Would you just tell me who you are and what you do? I'm Jeff Ball, I'm a cinematographer. Okay. Um, first question in is, um, could you describe what you feel is being sold to the general populace as HD? What you feel about that? Uh, the general populace are getting something yeah, <laughs> the transmitted pictures they're getting are compressed to hell. Um, they're marginally better than the compressed SD signal they get. Actually, they're a bit better. But they'll soon jam as many stations as they can and compress them to hell again. Um, the general populace are not getting HD, and I doubt ever will. The same way that they never got really good SD. I mean, we went from analog, um, to, to, ref, to digital SD, the quality went down. Um, the quality of HD should be seriously better than SD. It's not actually that much better. And it's a thing that's annoyed me immensely with HD, that the quality in a lot of cases has gone down and down and down since I first saw it and first worked with it. Um, I first saw HD back in Oh, 82, I think. Um, might have been 83, 84, but it's that time frame at IBC uh, in Brighton, as it was held then. And Sony were inviting people who had bought their lightweight cameras and were obviously showing an interest in, in shooting in a very portable way and were vocal about what they wanted from cameras to, to look at a new system they had. And at the time I had the Sony BVP 330, well, I had three of them, in fact, um, which was pretty much the best camera you could get at the time in a, in a portable variety. And I went in and I saw two monitors facing me. And I thought, well, the one on the right must be the 330 because the one on the left looks dreadful. And in fact, the one on the left was the 330 and the one on the right was a prototype HD camera, um, both just shooting at Brighton so Beach. Was this an NHK development at the time? Uh, it was. No, it was Sony. It was Sony. Yeah. And it um, preceded the, the, the Philips... Bye. Yeah, yeah. This was the one that um, Coppola was involved in. He, I saw some test footage he'd shot, um, and I was amazed by it. Um, but that one never really became commercially available. I then saw a 1250 line system, which was Philips, and I went to visit a recording of a concert in the city in a church, and was amazed at the picture quality. But it was at that time I was shooting corporate films for BMW. This will be the mid to late 80s, late 80s. And we were shooting them mostly on 16 mil. And they then came to us and said, we've been offered this equipment. Would you try using it? And this was the big CCD HD camera that Sony made for a very short time. And I don't think they made very many of them, uh, going to a one inch recorder. And I have memories of uh, going around the test track at BMW in Munich with the camera strapped to the bonnet of a BMW with a cable looped across to a van. And the van had a, a huge recorder in it and a generator to power it. And basically we went around the test circuit as fast as the van could go around the test circuit, rather than as normally we went around as fast as the car could. But the pictures out of the system were stunning. Absolutely amazing. I was just blown away by it. And it was great going from computer graphics to live picture because although it didn't have, and I didn't care that it didn't have a film look. You know, people said, oh, it must look like film. And it's like, no, it shouldn't. It just should be good pictures. Because um, I was going backwards and forwards between film and video all the time. And I, you know, you use, you use them for whatever's best for, for that, you know, for the job you're doing. So when you were doing like a, a, a 3D CGI of a car going around a circuit, and you then dissolve through to the real car going through the circuit, the, the high quality of, of that HD system then was, was ideal for it. It was, it was really stunning pictures. But of course it was horrendously expensive and horribly immobile. Um, and then years later, Sony introduced the wonderful, in inverted commas, uh, HD cam system, which I, on every occasion I possibly could, tore apart. Uh, because while the camera was adequate, the recording system was just appalling. Um, they basically used the, all the body shells they had for beta cam, digi beta, 
and had compressed the HD signal down to a rate that you could record on Digibeta. Uh, in actual fact, the original data going to tape was about 2% more than the original data going to tape with Digibeta. Uh, okay, in that case, why don't I just take a Digibeta signal, put it into a Snell and Wilcox box and up-res it to HD because there's as much original data there. And I did try that. You know, we did some side-by-side -side tests and the horrifying thing is, horrifying for Sony, is that the Digibeta up rest looked better than HD cam. Mm. Then things moved on. And, yeah. and that, early, that early HD cam system, I mean, I heard from one engineer very early on, there was a swap off from, they'd taken an NTSC system and it swapped off the processing power of uh, speed against resolution. Yeah? That's I think that's probably true. I mean, they, they basically <coughs> made all the sacrifices they could to fit into equipment they already had and to fit into a, a low bandwidth world. Um, but to get real HD, you need serious bandwidth. Uh, and by real HD, I mean 1920 by 1080 in RGB, uh, uncompressed. And that's, well, it's dual HD SDI. So what did, what did you feel about the strategy of literally lopping off 500 pixels going to the 1440 level? Um, I did do a presentation at, I can't remember which conference it was now, um, where I kind of said that it was absolutely possible to show you could make roads, you could get more cars on roads by making cars smaller. Of course, you wouldn't be able to get people in the cars, but on paper it looked great. And the same thing is you could make more clothes uh, by making them smaller would fit people, but on paper it looks great. And that to me was what HD cam was when it started. Um, since then, Sony have repositioned HD cam, and now it's not the replacement for 35mm, which they launched it as, it's a replacement for format shooting documentaries. That to me makes sense, and that to me is what it always was. Uh, but it never worked in the first version. The second version stumbled along. Version 3 was pretty good, and the fourth version, the Slash R, is actually very good. And I'm, I used it for some commercials last year. I was very happy with it. Could, could anything have been done, done differently, te technically, in the early days? Need they have done what you've just described? <sighs> Interesting. Um, yes, I think to get the product out at a price they thought they could sell and make money on, um, I think they were forced to do that because I was involved in the launch of the Viper, which must be seven years ago now, 2001, I think. Um, and I shot all the launch material for the Viper. And the big problem that um, Thompson had with that is that they built a camera to produce a good image with no compromises for the recording format. And the camera produced stunning pictures, but there was nothing available to record it. Um, and I think they'd worked on the basis that by the time they finished the camera and it was on the market, someone would have introduced a recorder. There was a recorder out there, a director's friend, which was a hard disk based recorder, um, which I have been told I was responsible for putting out of business um, <laughs> because I called it the cameraman's enemy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it was an appalling piece of machinery. Um, and unfortunately, the manufacturers wouldn't listen the designers that wouldn't listen to anybody. I introduced them to a number of people like Alan Davio and Bill Bennett and uh, Roy Wagner to try and get them to understand how we worked as cameramen and what we needed from a camera. And they just didn't want to know. Luckily, um, S2 came along with a great system and a very well thought out system, um, uncompressed, recording the DPX files, which is what we were using in film transfers and so on. And they brought a system along, not just a recorder. And that's part of the problem with HD all along. That, and I think it's important to separate HD and digital cinema because digital cinema is being held back in a lot of ways by the compromises made for HD television. Um, and I think it's Martin Eurasian for digital imaging, digital cinema to, to thrive we have to throw away everything we know about HD television um, because there are compromises made for compression, for transmission, compression for recording, 
Um, it's a to everywhere along the way the tape based formats are a compromise. Uh, HD Cam SR is much less of a compromise and in fact works except you need a power station to work with it. Um, it's interesting to me that you mentioned DigiBeta because it has to bring up the issue of uh, colour depth really. Well that was the real shocker for me um, and the colour depth issue was one that I hadn't really appreciated until, until I did the launch of Sky Digital for IBC. I shot a promo for them showing that they were going HD. And we had, it was meant to be shot on HD cam one side, same scenes being shot on DigiBeta and being shot on HD cam. And I said that, I argued heavily that if we were gonna do this, we should actually do the best you could do with HD. And so we went Viper and S2. There were problems involved in that because S2 was very early then. And we had a few issues with it, but I phoned up one of the guys at S2 in America, got him out of bed and got the thing fixed. And the backup was superb. But the interesting thing is when we came to do the compilation, what stood out wasn't the resolution, which is what everyone thought would be standing out, but the colour. And it was a real eye-opener. We picked a location, it's a dance centre in, in South London, where all the walls either have primary or secondary colours on them and mixtures. It's um, a colour-rich environment, I think is the nice way to put it. It's shocking. But the great thing was that on HD, it was clear. It was clear. <laughs> That's it. On the DigiBeater, there was amazing, not banding, which I thought we would get, but we didn't, but there was just no, the tonal range was so limited compared to what we were getting off uncompressed HD. It was staggering. And for me, the, the, the quest now, having shot two films digitally um, with a mixture of formats, I think we've used a total of 11 or 12 different formats across the two um, films. The most important thing is not resolution at all but it's bit depth. And the more color data you have, the better the pictures are. Why don't, why don't you expand on that? I mean, our, our, our audiences are people who would have investigated this stuff. So we can, we can, we can really go for that bit. Because there's also the issue of modular transfer function in here somewhere. MTFs are, oof, yes, an interesting one. You need to talk to John Galt at Panavision about that. He does a wonderful presentation on it, uh, on Nyquist and so on. And that is a, a, a serious issue that we have to address, um, that your resolution needs to be twice the resolution of what you're recording, um, otherwise you get more air effects. And to get round that, in fact, all the HD people use bandwidth limiting filters in the camera. So they don't actually shoot anything like the detail that they could because it causes problems. Um, the color issue is, is a fascinating one that yeah, it's difficult because it goes into all kinds of issues. It goes into the YUV system used for TV. It goes into plain RGB. It goes into Bayer patterning and what happens with Bayer patterning. And it goes into lies, damned lies and pixels um, that you hear in staggering figures being thrown around by some people, you know, that it's got 16 bit color depth and it's got 4,000 K resolution. Well, they haven't. The simple fact is that if you're using a Bayer system, the best you're going to get is effectively divide the, the number of pixels by 1.4. That's how stills cameras have worked out the resolution for a long, long time. Um, and that's, if you do real, real world tests, that's what you get. The only manufacturer of a Bayer pattern camera that's honest about this is ARRI. Um, ARRI use approximately a 3K sensor, but they say the camera's 2K. And that's what you get out of a 3K sensor. You get 2K. If you've got good software, if you haven't got good software, you get much less than that. Uh, because the thing that people 
don't understand is that with a three chip system, you're actually producing full resolution red, green and blue at the camera head. What you do with it later in recording is another matter and processing in camera is another matter. But at the camera head, you're producing 1920 by 1080 or 2K by 15 if it's DCI. With a Bayer, you're producing one signal that is split line by line into RG, 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 and onto the next line, GB, 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 GB. So the maximum horizontal resolution you've got is half the number of pixels. And the maximum resolution vertically is green will be 100%, but red and blue will be half. Um, now, with, you can use maths to work out some of what's missing. So you don't get half of what it is, you divide by 1.4. And some people say, we can get much more than that. Yeah, right, I've got a bridge, do you want to buy it? You know, great bridge. Um, there's no magic. So there's an issue of physiology here. Somebody's made some judgments about what's good for us, what, what we can uh, generate. <laughs> well, this is one of the things that, it's a line I used at a conference years ago which um, upset a number of video engineers. Um, and it was about choices of compression and choice of color space. And I said, you know, engineers were wonderful. They did a great job and we really need them. But if you look at the way they dress and the pen protectors they wear, do you want people like this making artistic decisions? And decisions of taste on color and so on, because no, I don't, you know, it's, they have no artistic taste whatsoever. Um, and the problem is they're imposing on us. Compression is either mathematically lossless or visually lossless. And I remember talking years ago to Ray Dolby, Mr. Dolby, mm. and he was saying, as far as he was concerned, around three was the absolute mathematical limit. And in fact, 2.6 was probably the practical limit of mathematically lossless compression, where you'd get everything back that you put in. And that's in fact what the HDCAM SR does in its high quality mode. Anything else is visually lossless. Well, who decides what's visually lossless? And the problem is it's the men in the white coats with the pocket protectors. Um, with a Harris Tweed jacket and sorry, you're not choosing what I think so is visually lossless. You, so you, you as a cinematographer, mm. we as cinematographers have to do something here. We have to engage in everything you've been talking about, but we have to have a mind. We have to park that one completely because in the end, we've got to generate atmosphere or something, learn how you describe it, on screen, aesthetics, all the rest of it. What are you doing? Where, so you've got your, that bit of your brain engaged. When you're on the shoot, what are you doing with that stuff? When I'm on a shoot, it, I have to bear in mind what format I'm using. Because I know that if I start to introduce smoke to a level, that there are formats which it will look horrendous on, where I will get banding, um, where it will just destroy the picture, basically. Others where if I don't use it, they'll look too clean and, and too clinical and you need something to give it a bit of depth. Um, I've argued for years that the film approach is the way that we should approach digital imaging, in that when we're shooting, we should use a system that is uncompromising, a system that captures everything you can possibly capture, far more than you'd ever want, and that then in post, in a restrained, quiet environment, we decide what we can throw away. We decide what in terms of latitude we don't need, what in terms of color we don't need, what kind of compression we can get away with. Because we can then watch, we have the time to watch it and see what effect it's having and make a decision based on whether we like it or not. So it's super critical, because there's this big argument. I mean, every, everything you're saying, I'm thinking of a question off it. It, it, it. There is so much going on at the moment. One of those things is if you're in the post, if you're in post. Now, a couple of years ago, there were worldwide meetings of cinematographers about being not even being run 
when the blimp post Oh, goes. and that certainly happens, uh, and there's no question. I was heavily involved in the post of Mutant Chronicles um, because I was taking, before we shot it, we set looks using speed grade, visual preview system, uh, which we then had, we could apply them to the monitors while we were shooting using a film light box. But those looks were then applied during the edit. So the look that the director and I had worked out for the film was applied all the way through. Um, and those were used as the reference for the final grade as well, which I couldn't attend because I was working out of the country. Um, a similar thing has been done on Dark Country, but they haven't graded that yet, so I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. But again, we had lookup tables applied to it all the time we shot. The material we shot with the silicon imaging cameras. When it came to the red, that was a different issue entirely. Um, there were no lookup tables available then. Um, there may be now, there are but they're going to do them their own way because they always do everything. They don't look at what anyone else does. They have to do it their way. Yeah. Um, so they won't be compatible with anything and they're going to cause people pain. Um, it's a pity, I'm going to digress now on the red, because I think it's a real pity. They, I think red has done an amazing job of building what they have in the time. Um, Jim Jallard and I had a big fight two years ago when he first introduced it. Um, We've since kind of kissed and made up, but he didn't make it on the schedule he said he would. And all the things I told him would go wrong, did go wrong. Most of them weren't dependent on him, they were dependent on outside suppliers, but it doesn't matter, they're going to go wrong. Um, and I think his whole marketing of whipping up this frenzy of believers, um, it's like Mac, you know, the Mac heads who absolutely hate Windows. And it's like, I don't. You use them if they work, they work. If they don't, they don't. Uh, it's not a religion. But the red is a religion. And people, they had to do everything their own way and didn't look at what anyone else was doing or what else was available or, or complete workflow. Or, and they got some great people involved, but they didn't actually get people involved who work end to end on a film. Um, and in, in your own test, what have you hmm. come up with a, with a resolution for the, the red? The red, I would say about 2.7. Oh, right, OK. Um, yeah. I've heard, one, I've heard as low as 1.8. But that's suddenly being really... Hmm. <laughs> yeah, but I can believe that. I mean, I, I would accept around 2.5, 2.7. Right. Um, which is fine. However, having said that, we shot Dark Country on the red at 4K and the SI at 2K, another Bayer camera. And everyone has been asking me, but isn't there a great jump when you cut between the two? Well, no one's really noticed. So who knows what resolution each camera's producing? But I think that's totally and utterly irrelevant. Uh, on those, the limiting factor there is the final format, which is 1920 by 1080 anyway. So any more than that, it's nice to have it because it's always good to have stuff to throw away and you know, as evidenced by the ARRI camera and you know they do produce nice images. And then coming out with this 3K apparently which presumably is 4K to get 3K. Oh, absolutely so they yeah. Yeah so you, you like the honesty of that. Yes I do I think their whole approach from the very beginning has been very straightforward and I've disagreed with them hugely on a number of things they've done. Um, the fact that because I went to Munich when they were working on breadboard prototypes and we talked at length about, as a number of DPs did who were invited over to look at them, about what we wanted. And I didn't want them to go anywhere near HD. Um, I wanted them to work only in RAW, only in log, yeah, yeah. Um, which is what they're doing now, as well as HD. But the first versions of the D20 that came out only worked in television, television space. Um, there is a very much, I think, a war of, there are two, two opinions. The one is that you make the pictures look the way you want them on set, bake them in, and basically bake them in in a way where you've almost damaged them so no one else can alter them. <laughs> Which is fair enough, yeah, yeah. because people are gonna screw with your pictures later. Yeah. Or there's the view that you get pictures with the widest bandwidth you can. Uh, 
shaped the way you want, lit the way you want, framed the way you want, but with a degree of latitude in, in highlights and shadows and so on, to be able to make some decisions later. I mean, this is bringing up the issue of, um, I mean, that, co that co question of before or after is, is also brings up issue, and, and the first question I asked you about, like, the stuff that you have to know and parking your technical head so your aesthetic mind can know. But there's this issue around film and video, and I don't mean the argument about hmm. what's first. I don't mean that one. I mean about working practice. Yes. And also the fact that uh, prime or primary DPs in Hollywood are mostly going to be used to the film area and mm -hmm. have to have their hands held at some level by the video model. I actually think if the cameras are right in that they have enough bandwidth and you're recording raw and uncompressed, then you just give a film DP the digital camera and they shoot. And there's absolutely no problem whatsoever. And I think if you give them Luthers or film uh, look generating boxes, um, they take them like a duck to water. Uh, they're used to making images, but they don't want to bake them in at the time. And there's a really, really simple reason for this. I had very early on in a film, a producer come up to me and say, remember Jeff, this is costing 25,000 pounds an hour. Don't spend time pissing around with pictures. And this is on a digital shoot. Now I was shooting that raw, uncompressed. So instead of spending time pissing around with pictures <laughs> on the set at 25,000 pounds an hour, we spent time pissing around with pictures at 500 pounds an hour in post or less. Um, and that, to me, makes much more sense. Okay, I, I was talking to a, a grader in the last couple of uh, last couple of weeks about an instinctive a, a sense that in in the old days, if you had a materially based medium, a photochemical medium like film, and you and people at some brave souls have maybe heated the developer hmm. a bit or maybe by bypass bleach or whatever, you materially affected it or underexposed it or whatever, yep. that there must be some kind of commensurate thing you can do in digital cinematography. Would you disagree or agree with that? Um, you can... No, I disagree with it. It's a different approach. There is a huge amount of image manipulation you can do afterwards. But then that you were talking to a conventional film grader there. Whereas I would say, talk to a colorist or talk to a grader who's become a colorist. No, it was a. It was a. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, they didn't know, by the way. They just quizzically. Hmm. Kind of said, oh, I'll have to think about no, there's not. Well, you can. I mean, you can do the equivalent of. This is what I'm saying about whether you were just on set or not. Um, you can tweak the hell out of a digital camera, and you can impose all kinds of contrast and. But the only things you can't pull back are clipping and crushing. Everything else can be altered later. And this was a revelation to me many, many years ago. Um, I'm trying to think where the colorist was. It's Gary Zabo, in fact, was the colorist responsible. Um, and he was at Frame Store at the time, so it's at 12 years ago at least. I shot a commercial for sure, um, deodorant, where they'd said it would be shot in the top floor of a warehouse with big windows in from the side, uh, people doing acrobatic stuff through it. And they'd said they wanted it contrasty, grainy, and blue. And I said, okay, you sure about this? Yeah, how contrasty? Very, 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 okay. We shot on 16 mil. We shot on 16 mil reversal. Yeah. Pushed it. <laughs> no. You want it contrasty, you want it, you know, we'll give you all of that. Cross-processed as well. Oh, right, okay. You know, so I've done everything I can <laughs> to give them what they've asked for and to give them no way back. I then we went on three weeks holiday, came back, one of the first things I saw on TV was that commercial, looking grey, desaturated and not very great. Gary, what the hell have you done to my pictures? You know, Jeff, that was really difficult. <laughs> but he'd managed to pull back what I thought was totally... Client had changed their mind, of course, which is what happens all the time in commercials. And at that point, I went, OK, there is nothing I can do to force people 
to do it the way I want it. They will always find a way to change it if they really want to. So all I can do is give them the best original material to work with. I will light it to give it the shape that I want. And if I want the shadows dark, I'll make damn sure that the shadows are dark when I shoot it. And if I want a flat looking image, I'll make sure the image is flat when I shoot it. I'll make sure that if I need to grab the sky to bring detail in, I will. But other than that, I'll do it in post. But you're moving, so... Th this is film, this is digital, this is video, whatever. Okay, but there's, there's a world where the changes happen en masse all the blooming time. But you as a DP in the film world are engaged, will be engaged on all of the projects that come because you're you and you do what you do. Yep. So there's a level at which your artistry is, should be the prevalent thing. Yes. But you still maintain the, the kind of back end, providing you can be on the grade. You need to be on the grade. But I mean, what I've just done on um, Street Fighter yep. was we... I had no way to get um, DPX files, obviously, because we're shooting on film. Although I did explore, can you scan something? Anyway, it just got way too expensive. Dailies on that were actually coming in on DV cam, and I was getting them in SD DVDs. So I've got no idea what I'm shooting. Um, I was also getting selected takes printed onto Vision Premier stock, the best stock you can get. But of course, no one's ever going to see it like that. Yeah. It's going to go through a DI. And it was, in a way, pointless for me to be looking at those film rushes. It was wonderful. You know, there are probably three people who've seen what the images could look like, and nobody else is ever going to see it like that. And I thought that was silly, to be honest. Um, it's great, but it's really self-indulgent. And what I was doing was I was using a Canon 350 digital camera, uh, which I use because the chip size is the same as Super 35. So if I'm using an 18 mil on the Arri, then 18 mil on that works. And I would take shots exposed exactly, I'd done tests to line it all up to match everything. Um, and I would shoot at exactly the same exposure I was shooting the film onto the digital still in raw mode. I would then take that into Adobe Lightroom. I used to use speed grade, I still use speed grade, but for this Lightroom was more convenient. And I would then email JPEGs of the day's shooting to the lab this is what these scenes look like make the dvds look like this um and it works i mean there were i must say technicolor in bangkok were tremendous we changed labs after a week and a bit first lab was not able to do that but technicolor were great and they worked really hard at doing that to the point where i there was one sequence which was a flashback sequence and Smith, the assistant editor, was actually sending the rushes back to Technicolor because they looked so bad. And it was Derek, the editor, had to go, no, 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 I've got the reference, grading references. That's exactly what Jeff wanted them to look like. Um, because, because it was an, a long flashback sequence, I'd actually put those frames into, I'd graded them in Lightroom, then put them into Tiffin DFX and applied a Technicolor two-strip look to it. So they looked pretty horrible but right for the sequence. And the lab did an amazing job of matching them. And an amazing job of matching them, which is why the assistant editor was going to reject them. <laughs> this doesn't look anything like the rest of it. Um, I mean, you but, mentioned no. a little while ago cross-processing. And mm. the reason I'm coming back to that is because whilst before with thoroughly digital, whenever that happens, mm. there's this moment where you could actually think of the uh, the, the digital cinema cinema cinematographic element as the almost reversal film in the sense mm. that you capture it, it's grabbed, but then you've got a, la a whole attitude of stuff you can do in, in, in the lab. So are you, mm. have you done any? I can do pretty much, I, well, I haven't found anything that I can do in the lab that I can't do digitally. Um, and I've tried and tested a lot and I can do a lot more digitally than I can do in the lab. And I think you know, photochemical processes are horribly crude, unbelievably crude, that you've got red, green, and blue. That's it. That's all you can adjust. 
Not red, green, blue highlight shadows, mid-tones. It's overall. That's all you've got. Red, green, and blue overall density. That's it. If I had to go back to that, it would be like having my eyes poked out. I can't believe it. It's, you know, I'm so used to saying, can you make that green a little more blue? Can you, oh, I don't, actually, can you pull the green saturation back completely? Because I'm notorious for not liking green. Um, can you put a bit more blue saturation in the sky? I think that skin turns a bit magenta. Can we just pull that round? Can you put a window across that just to bring the level of that down? Can you pull a bit more out of his shirt? You know. How do you relate to your grade? The what? Uh, whatever you would call it, timeless colorist grade. What, what's your... um, I, you, I think that's a vital relationship, and it's a relationship that is at least as important as that one with, as with your gaffer. Um, I work with one colorist and one gaffer for at least 12 years, more than that actually, probably like 15. Um, we have a relationship. We know what we like, we like as a group. Mm -hmm. And it's a collaborative effort. It's not, you know, yes, I am the one that finally says yes or no, but everyone contributes and contributes hugely to it. Um, where Ozzy McGaffer will just thought about, and do you think, oh, yeah, why not? Um, the same thing that Gary, my colorist, I'm trying to get him to do Street Fighter. Well, let's fight with the production, but we'll see what happens. Um, we don't have to talk. I was doing a short film last summer. I was sitting there grading it with him. We were very fast grading. We had 10 hours to grade a 30 minute film. Um, and I'd be sitting there going, hmm. <laughs> Wouldn't actually say anything. It would just be, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. And he knew where it should be going. And it would be, yeah, this should be a bit punchy. This is more like, and I'd refer to a commercial that we'd done together or something. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, but can you put a bit more of... And then suddenly it would start to go somewhere else. Um, and at times, when I've been doing a job with Gary, I was doing a um, car job with him, and I couldn't actually get to the grade. Um, but what I did was, at home, was sit down and take some holiday pictures. Deb's leaning against a car in desert in Arizona. Nevada, actually. Um, and I did different grades in Photoshop in it and then emailed them all to him, numbered, said, this is the thought process, this is the route that I was following. And he said many times that that actually really helps to see the path you're following, to get an idea of, okay, that's where you were going. And it was a great uh, colorist called Jet. And I mean, she did something that I, many, many years ago when she was at Russia's, I was doing um, a commercial that had some very saturated, very contrasty looks to it. And she spent ages getting the look. And it's like, is that right, Jeff? And it's like, yeah. She said, right, I'm gonna take this all apart because I've gone the wrong route to get there. And she then regraded it from scratch and took seconds to get to that look. Because, you know, ah, well, if I was, knew I was going there, I wouldn't have started from there. Wonderful. And I think for a colorist to just say, right, rip that, all those settings apart and start from scratch because now I know where we're going is really brave and it's terrific to do. As it happens, I've known Jeff for a bit and that's mm. not working with some Right, <laughs> well, well then. <laughs> but what I'm thinking about whilst you're describing this process, did you start in film? I started in stills. Okay, and did you go to film? or go Went to, to film, film, then to television, then back to film. See, I'm just wondering, in this, this career, you, you've got the, basically, as, pe as people go in this game, You've got the route. You've got the route to end up in electronic cinematography in a certain kind of way, it seems to me. And there's a lot of people... Who don't have a mixed background. Yeah, now what... what and a mixed background, I think, is essential. It's, um, it's funny, you've got to have not just an art background, but a, partly a science background as well. And I did double maths and physics at A-level. Oh. And then I went to art school. Brilliant. You know, so yeah. it's a... <laughs> It's a strange mixture. It's a good mix. Yeah, I think it's an yeah, I think it's for the way digital imaging works. It's an essential mix. Um, but having said that, I like the technology, and when I moved 
I moved from film to television by accident. And basically there wasn't any work and I got work operating a television camera. What's this? Um, Marconi Mark 8. <laughs> Horrible big thing. <laughs> worked with a 7, I worked with a 5 even. Um, <laughs> And I must say, you know, if you, anyway, that's, I'm going to talk let's, about image quality, but that's... Well, let, let's look around the, the, the spectrum now is, I mean, just because Red are sort of in such kind of, they're on their soapbox, aren't they? And they're, they're offering up a 5K and NHK is messing around with 8K. But then there's the, the NHK 8K, sorry to interrupt, yeah, but that it. is just stunning. Okay, tell me... I tell mean, me the what... image quality, it's the... Only time I've heard a, a seasoned audience of engineers at NAB gasp. Right. You know, that we all looked at, they brought up a field of sunflowers and it was, <gasps> what the? Stunning. I mean, just stunning. And there is an argument that maybe we should be going there instead of 3D yeah. because the image has such depth. The one thing it did ram home to me, though, is that engineers should never be allowed to shoot demo films <laughs> because it was truly appalling. <laughs> and the How reason... How did they demonstrate an 8K image? They had an 8K projector. They had an 8K projector. I think it was actually four 4Ks or, what, you know... Yeah, something... Yeah, yeah, okay. Just tiled together. But it was working. And have you any desire to get involved in, in that at all? Or are you just waiting for them to sort of... No, no, I'm not out? working with NHK, but I do work with other manufacturers on cameras. I, I work at with... That, at that resolution? Level. Not at that resolution, but there are other companies working at other resolutions, and there are non-disclosure agreements, so... You yeah, know, yeah, no, it's, this um, is something I got with Dave, <laughs> Dave, and Dave Stump and Scott Phillips. For the, might well be working on the same things. Who a lot, there's, a, there, there's a question, you know, when you say, for instance, OK, so we're at four... Or might we go to eight? What's the military working on? Sixteenth, yeah. whatever. And then people stop talking because there are non-disclosure agreements. And that's the problem. And, but, but there is the question of the physiology. So there's all of that, and it's great for satellites that need number plates or whatever the hell. There is. What a, about us? Right. Very simple. Um, Dave Bancroft of Grass Valley now was Phillips, then Thompson, BTS. You know, the name changed every day. Dave Bancroft did a wonderful presentation once. Um, where and a lot of the audience got offended because he said he suddenly we're talking about 2k 4k he said, I don't know what we're arguing about because three quarters of you couldn't tell the difference anyway and got, of course we could and he paused he said because you're sitting in the wrong seats that after the first quarter of the rows of seats in a, in a theater you're too far away for your eyes for the resolution to tell between 2K and 4K. Um, that's an HD set behind you. But at this distance, where we're 10 feet away, eight feet, 10 feet, on a 32 inch screen, you can't tell the difference between HD and SD. You can, you can tell the color space actually, going back to that. And that's a significant difference, but you can't tell the resolution. And so I think the obsession with higher and higher resolution even, you know, for a cinema projection, 2K is... Okay, 4K would mean the people in the front rows get the best they're going to get. But further back, you're not going to get it. So if you say 4K is the best that an audience is ever going to be able to see, then I guess you want to shoot at 8K. Nyquist, twice the frequency you want. Give it a margin and go 10K. <laughs> the reason I stopped the tape just now was because uh, it seems to be a crux one. I can remember where the notion, even, of having a chip was just incredibly wonderful. Then it's about, it's about horizons, isn't yes. it? So here we are at a horizon, which is, you know, a 1920 by 1080 horizon. Is, it, is everything that follows in terms of the discussion amongst the people who are very interested in the physics of it all, is that extra to requirements and what is well, the requirement well this is the whole thing and this is where it gets interesting and i just jumped while you were asking the question and suddenly went of course i'm talking about theaters i'm talking about people going to see a movie but let's face it i'm a science fiction freak and behind you is a sliding glass wall that's 18 feet by eight feet roughly why can't that 
or that window over there, or that window over there, or that one there, uh, in a room full of windows, obviously. Um, why can't they be screens? And why can't they be screens with a resolution where when you slide that window open, you can't tell the difference between reality and the picture? And what resolution do you need for that? Well, we know the resolution, the angle of arc that the eye will resolve, but then you're talking about what distance you are away from it. And okay, 4K is good for the front row of a movie theater. Cool, that's, an, that's a you know, point to get to. But if you've got a screen that's 18 feet by eight feet and you're gonna stand a foot away from it, then what resolution do you need then? Now, obviously you can work that out, you can work out the angle of arc and so on and the pixel density you need, but it's huge. It's absolutely ginormous. And do we want that? Well, yeah. As we get less and less space, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if you can switch your windows, your walls into different things, into different views? That a lot of apartments, all they do is look at over the next apartment. Wouldn't it be much nicer to have a nice sea view? Wouldn't it have the whole wall as a nice sea view? You know, we're into serious science fiction land. But whereas once upon a time it was fantasy land, it's not fantasy land anymore. It's actually probably within my lifetime. You know, I'm 57. <laughs> and this is going to affect architecture? Absolutely. And it, it will change, totally change the way we live. That people laughed at Bill Gates back in the, when was it? The late 70s, when he bought the digital rights to various galleries. And they all took the money and run, you know, ran, laughing at him. Going, reproduction, you know, it's appalling. But if you can reproduce a picture, okay, not in 3D, not to get the depth of the paint, well, yet. Um, because there are systems starting to come now which give you 3D without glasses. Um, the Philips WOW system, which they demonstrated last year at IBC, they've actually started to deliver. Uh, at the moment, a 32-inch set costs £20,000. But they've said that within three years, it'll cost £1,200. Once you've got 3D without specs, and once you've got ultra-high resolution, then a painting on a wall will look as good as it's ever going to look. You, you must know Bob Shaw's The Light of Other Days. No, Do you know this one? no, I don't. It's about slow glass. It's about the slowing down of light through glass so that they become picture panes that you expose on Scottish hillsides and bring to the city. <laughs> so you just, wonderful. You just gone completely there. You're the first yeah. person, actually, that I've been talking to uh, that, that, okay, you, you, there's a different track here. It's, it, to my mind, for some reason, somehow, some way, high definition technologies are epitomizing the trajectory of, of physics and development of gadgetry in the world. Un underpinning that is the, the, crack, uh, the crack in the mass around wavelet transforms. Um, could you just describe for us um, your, your grasp of wavelet transforms and if they are important, why they are important? Um, almost none. So that's, you know, not the worth... The grasp of the, the transform itself? Yes. The fact that there's a soft... Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to get into that. Too, too heavy, that one. Uh, not, I can't be clear enough about it. Okay, it's, it's, uh, I talked to, there is an astrophysicist knocking around that uh, Scott Phillips is in contact with, right. Mara Graps. And she assures me that the, the, uh, the, the fact that we have wavelet transform technology, which is, as, as far as I understand, is a, is a soft approach to data. It's ex it expands as the data gets more complex, which is great because it's intelligent, but that it's a complete byproduct of... Uh, dust particle physics and all of that other stuff. But for some reason, what I'm seeing is that it's appearing in the world through HD. But you nodded but, when I said, well. Well, there are just so many byproducts and so many um, cross fertilizations. I mean, I'm totally used to using image stabilization, 
the way we say an example um, shooting a commercial uh, we were shooting it was for cinema so we're shooting it actually we're shooting it at, at, so it was a television commercial shooting standard definition shooting on 35 and it was meant to be image stabilized with a West Cam space ball and a helicopter and although we had the budget to do it we didn't have the schedule we couldn't fit around the West Cam availability so we shot the entire, and the producer said to me, is there any way we can deal with this, Jeff? And I went, well, yeah, but it's going to be horribly expensive. This was 1999, something like that. So nine years ago, an eternity. Um, I said, yeah, we can shoot it on 35, open gate. We can shoot it with a closed down shutter, 11 degree shutter, so every frame is razor sharp. We can then scan it at 2K, shoot it all slightly wider than we want image stabilize it at 2K, because you need the resolution to move it around, then reduce it to standard definition and add motion blur to it. Worked brilliantly. I haven't used a West Cam since. I've done everything like that, except now instead of telecineing at 2K, you transfer at 4K for a 2K finish, which is what we've just been doing on um, Street Fighter. And that technology comes from missile tracking, from the Israelis originally. But that's been advanced so much by the software people writing pixel tracking software, that's now fed back into military use. And they're learning from what we do. And it's just, there is such a cross-fertilization of software, of the technology. Um, there, there was something... just. I mean, on that note, hmm. there were some agreements in uh, the 70s between video artists and uh, uh, expensive post-production houses in New York. And the post-production houses gave the artists access at $5 an hour because the artists... Would push the technology. Would push the technology. And they then learn from where it goes. Yes, it's absolutely the case. And... Well, for example, with Silicon Imaging, who I think are the right approach to digital imaging. I think their whole approach is very different to the one of RED, it's not flash. Could you describe why it's the right? What okay, what is? Silicon Imaging have done from the very beginning, and they based, they're a company who originally did scientific cameras, and that, but they're making now a digital imaging cinema camera, at 2K at the moment. Um, they have looked at what we need to make films not just to make moving images, but a complete workflow. Um, they have not just looked at how cameras were made, but how you can, what you can do to change them to make them better, what you can keep to keep it familiar, and what you can change. And of course, the first thing they did was remove the sensor. So the sensor is in a separate box, which will clip into the front and make it a one-piece camera. But the sensor itself is in a little cigarette-sized packet, which full-size lens clips on. And you connect it with a Cat5 internet cable, ethernet cable. It's just, there is no reason for the electronics to be with the camera. Of course, the next decision they made, do we need to use dedicated electronics? Once we've actually processed the signal out the camera head, in the camera head, and we've got digital signal coming out, we've done the A to D conversion at the head. Why reinvent everything? Why not take a laptop, write software for it, because the laptops are fast enough now, and use that? Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. It reduces the price, it opens it up totally to... Well, then you suddenly realise you're working with a software-based camera. And... I was working with a prototype, I mean the, the prototype prototype on mutants where we had to get back focus on the PL mount using spark plug uh, sensors as shims where the fastening on it was so loose that we had to use PTFE tape around the PL mount to hold it in place. It's great. We we're getting software upgrades once or twice a day. It's like, how the hell does it? Oh, ah, it's not, no, well, hang on a second. <laughs> Brilliant. And I suddenly had, and you could run it at, 2K 
20, up to 30 frames a second, or you could go to 1280 by 720 and write 72 frames a second. And one day while I was on the phone to them, these transatlantic calls all the time, I suddenly went, hang on a second. Does this mean there's a magic maximum number? And they went, what do you mean? I said, well, horizontal per pixels, vertical pixels, time frames per second. There must be a number, you know, that all of these kind of is the master number. You know, why would you want that, Jeff? I mean, what would you do if you knew what that was? And I was doing inserts um, for mutants. I said, well, for example, you could make me 2,000 pixels by 1,000, by 100 pixels, but at 150 frames or 200 frames. It's like, uh, yes, but why on earth would you want to do that? Well, I'm shooting models and it's trench warfare. I only want that strip to dip, dump in. And if I can have 150 frames of that strip, and the great thing about them was they understood. You're talking to them about, oh, yeah, we could do that. Now, that's actually not in the production cameras. But I'm fairly certain that an email would get you the software to do it. And that was an example of their approach. They listened to what you want to use the camera for. And they don't try and impose what they think is right. Wonderful thing they've done electronic viewfinder. They've got an OLED type one that's 1280 by 720. But instead of the tacky, horrible, plastic monstrosities that everyone else puts in front of the display, and that's Sony, Panasonic, Grass Valley, Red, everybody. They went to PNS Technic, who make replacement viewfinders for ARRI cameras, and put in a proper film type focusable, calibrated, readjustable viewfinder. Now, why on earth would you want that? A number of people have said to me, what's wrong with it? But well, one, the plastic lenses lose resolution for focusing. Two, I look through a lens, a viewfinder, my eyes are appalling. I'm a minus 5.5. Viewfinder's adjusted for me. The director then goes to look through the viewfinder. He can't see a thing. If it's calibrated, you can dial it in. And the AC's job, one of the jobs of the AC, one of the many, many jobs of the AC, mm -hmm. is to, when someone goes to the viewfinder, is set it to what they, their eyes are. It speeds things up. They've made an optical viewfinder for it. Yet you lose a stop because it's a beam splitter. But why do I want an optical viewfinder? Well, there's an interesting discussion going on at the moment on CML about how long it takes to boot up a camera. Now, I come from a background where you pick the camera up and you look through the viewfinder. Boot up time? Get out of here. Um, you know, with a Viper, you flick it on and basically by the time you've got your eye to the viewfinder, it's working. A red is, they say 45 seconds. It feels like hours as is the SI is about the same about 40 seconds or so it feels like forever so you put an optical viewfinder on you don't have to worry about how long it's taking to boot up you don't have to worry about power consumption because the viewfinder isn't using any power um, an argument I had at the beginning with Harry about the D20 which was based on a 435 initially it's now based on an LT was they said, oh, and of course we're taking out the beam splitter for the video assist. It's like, no, don't! And they went, what do you mean, don't? I said, don't. Keep a standard def video assist camera pointing at it. And I was like, why on earth would you want to do that? Two reasons. One, there is a standardised workflow and work pattern working with video assist. There's all kinds of video assist kit around and people who operate it. And standard def is good enough for video assist. In fact, it's probably better in most cases because you always get people looking at the monitors helping you. And I would rather they didn't. And I used to specialise at one point in asking companies to give me their worst monitors. So I could just ask just the monitor. Um, the other reason, of course, is that an HD or a digital camera chews up power, whereas a little standard definition video assist camera 
uses almost no power. You could have the digital camera power down, but still use video assist for everyone else to see what you're framing up. I mean, a lot, a lot of the way that you're talking is about it's, it, there's a sheer kind of common sense element. Well, I think to all of this, yeah. I think coming from a stills background and taking the stills background into film, and then taking the film background into television, and then taking the television back into film. Um, yeah, there's an abs absolute. No one used to talk to each other. There used to be their film, their television, their features. I mean, when I moved into commercials, it was a nightmare for me because I was a documentary camera. And the crew treated me appallingly. I was brought in as a director of photography over the camera operator, the AC, the second AC. And I hadn't got a clue what I was doing because I was a documentary cameraman. That had to be sorted. It was done. Um, but there was a real snobbery about that. And there still is. There's a snobbery between film or movies and... And that's interesting. The snobbery now is changing in that it's not film or digital. It's long-form, short-form, long-form for big screen versus small screen and so on. There's always going to be that kind of stupidity. Um, I think... If you apply common sense to, to how you work and try to cut through traditional working, why do you do it like that? You've always got to ask why. Now, some people ask why and won't listen to the answer. No, our way's better. Well, actually, it's not. And at the moment, unfortunately, the business is full of people telling you we've got a much better way to do that. And in most cases, they haven't. They just actually don't understand why you do it that way. Um, so if I were to say to you now, mm -hmm. at, we've probably got a minute left. Yep. Um, I mean, I thought it was a pretty good end where you were getting to there, but if there was anything you felt that you hadn't said about the game as it stands, to encapsulate it into a shorter <laughs> 30 <laughs> seconder, is there something to be said? Look everywhere for ideas. Not just film, not just television, look at stills, look at... Look at workflows from totally different businesses. Because it's a great thing that Grass Valley are doing with the Infinity camera, where they make the chips for it. And they went, hang on a second, we're producing digital images now, why the hell don't we just go into the computer business and buy ready-made you no know, rev drives, compact flash cards, uh, use USB connections, use Firewire connections. Why do we need to do that? Why don't we do what we're good at? And I think that's the lesson to learn, that a lot of the problems we're facing have already been solved. The problems with data have been solved by banks and insurance companies. They have humongous amounts of data to deal with. Look at how they deal with it. Copy them which, of course, is what S2 did when they went to LTO. Thank you very much. You're welcome.